it is my absolute pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, Nancy Cohen Israel. Nancy Cohen Israel is an independent art historian, art educator, writer, and curator. She's a regular lecturer here at the Meadows Museum, and she's taught at colleges and museums throughout the area. Israel is a regular contributor to Patron Magazine. Writing primarily about the visual arts, she's contributed to numerous local and national publications. She earned her master's degree in art history from the George Washington University in uh, Washington, DC, where she focused on Renaissance painting. Her career has spanned the art world, including positions uh, as the exhibition coordinator at the Trust for Museum Exhibitions in Washington, DC. She was a McDermott intern in education at the Dallas Museum of Art and the director of the Edith Baker Gallery. So it's my pleasure to, uh, to turn it over now to Nancy Cohen Israel. Thank you, Anne, would help if I unmuted. And thank you all so much for joining us today as we explore what the French call nature mort, a dead nature. And what I'm hoping is that by the time we are finished here today, you will all see that it's not quite dead nature and that there were actually innovations in still life painting, which I know sounds a bit like an oxymoron, but if we look even at some of the work in our own collection, that you know, these corpses, if you will, the still life with game fowl by Pedro de Comperman and this ram's head from an unknown maker in Seville, you can see where still life can kind of get a bad rap. And just to sort of give you an idea of how different mentalities or how mentalities change through the ages, you know, objects such as these, that is still life with game fowl, were actually considered somewhat aspirational because it meant if you had an image of game fowl that maybe you had enough land that you could go hunting your fowl on it. So much different now when for those of us living in the city, maybe, you know, if anyone likes rabbit, we've got plenty in my neighborhood. But otherwise, you know, for wild game, that would be the sort of thing that you would need sort of an estate, a large amount of land to go hunting on. And so to have a still life like this might imply that you would be wealthier than maybe you actually were. Now, the other interesting thing about still life painting is that somehow, whomever it is or was that designates where painting goes in a hierarchy, decided a long time ago that history painting is the top of the top on a par with religious painting. And then underneath that, you sort of have royal portraiture. And then there's a huge thick double line underneath of which you have genre painting, scenes of everyday life. And below that is still life painting. So again, bottom of the heap. However, the advantage of still life painting is that it could be done on a small scale and it was accessible to everyday people. And so you have in Spain anyway, artists who are really very renowned artists such as Francisco de Zerberon also painting still life paintings. It's a way to make a little bit of extra money. And on the left, you've got his just luscious cup of water and rose on a silver plate with this beautiful lighting, the tenebrism that is very popular in 17th century Europe, thanks to Caravaggio, who we'll look at momentarily, and the work of Juan de Zerberon, the still life with apples and orange blossom on the right. And so it becomes the kind of painting that almost anybody can have. And if you want to put it in modern parlance, I was thinking a lot about this, you know, what would be something comparable nowadays? And perhaps food historians will look at this time and say, oh, kale salads with quinoa and goji berries. This was what everyone was supposed to be eating. But then they might come across something from the State Fair of Texas and see fried butter or fried Oreos or any number of fried things that, you know, might not have been might not or definitely not the healthiest things, but what people like. And so I think you can almost draw an analogy between this and still life paintings. That there's clearly a market for these still life paintings that we will see you know, over and over and over again throughout the next half hour. The influences of still life paintings in Spain, as with most other things, come from abroad. Spain was just full of foreign artists working for the court, working for the church particularly from Italy and from the Netherlands. And so you still have these influences 
that infiltrates still life painting. The painting on the left is by a female artist, Feda Galizia, glass compote with peaches, jasmine flower, and quinces, and a grasshopper. Early, she was an early 17th century painter in Northern Italy. And that became the place, this area around Milan for still life paintings, usually of fruit. We've got an early painting by Caravaggio from 1599 on the right. Not only was he a very adept still life painter, as you see here, this was painted before he went to Rome, but he then took that skill to Rome with him and you know the rest. I mean, his lighting became the hallmark for 17th century painting. And really the realism that he used was also an element gleaned from this early, these early still life paintings that he did before he went to Italy, to, I'm sorry, to Rome. And we even have in our collection a painting by an unknown artist of one of these fruit baskets. And hard to say if this is what it really looks like or it's just in need of a good cleaning. As you can see here, the dates range between 1630 and 1690 which is really kind of a big deal because if it was painted in 1630 or in the 1630s, it was very much a part of the avant-garde. It was what people were doing. By 1690, it was already quite passe. And so I would love, you know, if anyone is looking to do something for the Meadows Museum, getting this painting cleaned and conserved with maybe ability to provide us with a little more information would be fabulous. So, but it is something we have in the collection that again, unfortunately doesn't see the light of day too much. What's interesting is that we'll look at the Northern influences and unlike artists in Spain who will be able to do still life paintings such as the Zerberons and other things, pretty much these Northern artists are pigeonholed. If you're painting florals, you're painting florals. That's what you do. If you're painting these breakfast pieces, that's what you do. And still life takes on a whole life of its own in the Low Countries. And by the Low Countries, I mean modern day Belgium and Holland, which at the time were under Spanish rule. And they follow a kind of a set pattern. So at the beginning of the 17th century, you've got these marvelous florals that were painted starting in Antwerp. And then this artist in particular, Ambrosius Boschert, ends up going to Zeeland, which is off the western coast of Holland, modern day Holland. And he goes there, his family is Protestant and they are driven out by none other than Alessandra Farnese, whose portrait we also have at the Meadows Museum, but done by a Flemish painter, Antonis Moore. So there's a lot of sort of cross pollination, pollination between these areas. And you've got these gorgeous flowers. What I wanna point out here are the tulips because this was a new flower. It had just arrived in the Low Countries from Turkey. So this is revolutionary. This is new. This is at the forefront of what's happening and, and in horticulture, contemporary horticulture. The one thing that is going to mark all of these influences from the Low Countries is this theme of mortality. And so in Boschert's painting, you've got beautiful flowers, often flowers that bloom at different times of the year, all stuffed into a small vase that even the most ardent floral designer might have a hard time arranging today. There are usually bugs. You see a fly here, you see a butterfly. And it's a reminder that like the flowers and like these bugs that can be crushed and whose life can be snuffed out in a moment, so too are we. And you see this in the um, breakfast pieces, these Onfein Stukjes that were popular in Harlem. Again, in the early part of the century, you've got this stein that's been turned over. And what's really typical of these paintings is just the fineness of the finish on the surfaces. But this overturned drinking vessel, again, you know, it's, its contents have are drained out of it, just like life will one time drain out of us. And so, you know, there is a lot of meat to these still life images. I can understand why people don't love them, but there's a lot more that meets the eye. And I'm going to just go through the Northern ones quickly, just so that we can of course get to the Spanish ones. But in Leiden from the 1620s onward, they start with the Vanitas paintings. Leiden was a new university. It was a gift to the city for having driven the Spanish out in 1574, 1575. And so you've got this, you know, all of these worldly goods, the, sorry, the instruments, the books, the seashells, the exploration, all of this that marked this former person 
as a, we'll say, man of learning. And, you know, all of these objects that we surround ourselves with, and in the end, does it really matter because this is how we all end up. So kind of a cheery way of, you know, expressing oneself. And then in Amsterdam, sort of as a nice antidote, you have that pronk still labor. You've got the still lives of ostentatious life that show these rich interiors, the nautilus shells, the fruit, etc. But then again, the clock, the ticking clock, the reminder. And this one is in Spain, as you can see in Madrid. Now, fortunately, when we get to Spain, um, they're not quite as maudlin. But you do have these artists who are working in a variety of different genres. And the first one we'll look at is Juan Sanchez Cotan, whose dates are 1561 to 1627. He's working in Toledo. And it's interesting that, you know, Seville was this major important city, port city, where you had a lot of middle class merchants and certainly a big market for still life painting. But it was in Toledo that it really takes off. And in Toledo, they had a very big textile industry and a very strong ecclesiastical communi community who really liked these paintings. In the meantime, Sanchez Cotan is also painting religious imagery, such as St. Ildefonso receiving the chasuble from 1600, as well as these crazy kind of genre paintings of which there are many in Spain of Brigitte del Rio, del Rio the bearded lady of Peñaranda. So, I, there are a number of these. I think Murillo did one as well. There's this fascination with bearded ladies. But he also starts doing still life painting. And this is really, again, kind of innovative to take produce and fowl and wildlife and put them together and make them the subject of a painting. What's interesting here is that, first of all, it's almost as if it's its own portrait, right? It's got this wonderful ledge that surrounds it, it's just flooded with this beautiful light that is very much in vogue in the 17th century, this tenebrism, the spotlighting made really fashionable by Caravaggio in Rome. And in, you often have these paintings of produce in which you've got a year round garden. So in this case, you've got the cardoon, which was a very essential element to the Castilian diet. It was a winter vegetable carrots, which were available year round, citrus, which was winter, spring, apples, summer, fall. And so again, for a place where you were reliant on the seasons, seasons, suddenly you can have all four seasons right here. And then the, the fowl was also harvested at different times as well. And he also is able to create some kind of dynamism and a kind of, um, dimensionality by affixing, in this case, the quince and the cabbage with string. And here he creates this incredible shadows with the um, ca quince, cabbage, melon, and cucumber, which you see over here. And I know the cucumber, I, when I first saw it, it looks like a cucumber or a pickle. And we spent a great deal of time on this in docent training a few weeks ago that it kind of reminds you of Salvador Dali, right? This pickle that is represents or cucumber resurrection. And um, definitely has phallic imagery, but not unusual in European painting. Carla Crivelli, the Venetian painter, also used quite a bit of these pickling cucumbers in his work. And here you've got a painting from 1480 of Madonna, and you'll often see these wreaths with these pickling cucumbers in them. So very enigmatic. They do not strike one as kind of the most um, inspiring vegetable to have in a painting, but there they are. And I don't know why uh, somehow a carrot or a cardoon is more inspiring than a cucumber, but there you have it. I, um, and I, again, I wish we were live so I could hear everybody else's opinion on this. So Sanchez Cotan has a very strong patronage base among the church and even among rulers such as Philip III. Now he's only painting these until about 1603, at which point he, en he enters the Carthusian monastery. And that's it, we don't really hear from him again artistically, but yet what he sets forth is going to remain really through the 1640s. And that's really when you start seeing the Zerberans in the 1630s and 1640s following his example. 
And so it's really quite a legacy for this style to persist for 40 odd years. Now, the next artist who really picks up the mantle of still life painting is Juan van der Hamen, whose dates are 1596 to 1631. And in right after such as Cotin's death, his work is inventoried and I'm sorry, not after his death, after the death of Cardinal Bernardo Sandoval y Rojas, who is the Archbishop of Toledo, his collection is inventoried and he was a big fan of Sanchez Cotan. Philip III acquires a number of these paintings, but he still wants more. Now, Philip III, if you're not familiar with him, his reign was not as marked as that of his grandfather, Charles V, or his father, Philip II, or his son, Philip IV. So somewhat uninspired, but he likes this work so much that he commissions van der Hamen to create work like it. And so in 1622, Juan van der Hamen does similar work, but moves it forward a little notch. And what do you think of this fabulous cartoon that almost looks more like a sea monster, almost like with these teeth that are coming out to eat us. And then you've got the quince hanging ominously over it, pomegranate, oranges, which, you know, if we looked at this from a religious perspective, we might think that the pomegranate represents resurrection, which it usually does in religious imagery, the oranges, the fruit of the tree of knowledge. But here, I don't know that it has any subtext. I feel that these are just showing these beautiful, delicious fruits for what they are. Now, unlike Sanchez Cotan, who was working in Toledo, which had been the capital under Philip II until 1561, Juan van der Hamen goes to the new capital, to Madrid, which in 1621 sees the ascent of a new king, Philip IV. Philip IV is young, he's still a teenager, and he vows to rule differently from his father, Philip III. And so such, I'm sorry, Juan van der Hamen sees this opportunity to do something new because everything is fresh and everything is changing. And so what he starts doing are these still lives of sweets. And it's really important to note because beginning in the 16th century, sugar starts to flood Spain and it's coming, all of Europe, but particularly Spain coming from the new world. Prior to that, sugar had been this incredible luxury that only the wealthiest could afford. And so here you see the still life just festooned with all kinds of delectable things and candied fruit. So it's not enough to have figs, but they're candied figs preserved cherries, preserved in sugar, these boxes that contained marzipan, another treat. And so you start having dessert, which is a courtly course, right? If you can barely afford food, you're not going to be spending it, or maybe you are, but on donuts. And so it's showing the wealth of this city. It's showing the wealth of the people who are able to afford these, which is an increasingly large number of people. And in so doing, van der Hamen also extends the table, if you will. These are much larger parapets. And rather than the string, he creates these different heights. And then he puts them in these low baskets, typical of the time and the era. And the, the custom was also, if you were, went to somebody's home and they had all of these goodies out, you were perfectly within your rights to take some home, which on the one hand you say is really nice, but on the other, you know, who wants day old? donuts. And so people would be able to take these from these beautiful plates. And you've got this kind of hanging precariously off the ledges as a way to show van der Hamen's incredible skill. He punctuates it with all of these beautiful terracotta ceramic vessels as well. And he expands his repertoire. And suddenly by this time, by the 1620s, and 1630s, you start seeing a lot of flowers in his work as well. And the reason for this is because his patron, one of his big patrons is the Comte de Sora, who is buying these, he buys this huge home, the Huerta de Sora, which has beautiful gardens. And so suddenly Juan van der Hamen includes these gorgeous florals. But in this, he's doing more than florals. You've got the fruits, the roses, and Venetian glass, which was very expensive, but which also populates a lot of this work. So imagine he's showing, I can paint glass, I can paint Talavera pottery and the fruit that goes in it and create this beautiful light on these artichokes, as well as the light on these flowers in a glass vessel 
with these new flowers that have just come to Europe, these tulips. Now, because we're learning at lunch, of course, I have to include some food in this. And if you want to create your own von der Hamen dessert, here is a recipe for Italian flourless chocolate cake with edible flowers. The recipe itself comes from the New York Times. The edible flowers are my own embellishment. This is a cake I actually made. And you can present it, you know, as a Spanish inspired still life cake. We are grateful, of course, even though it's Italian, to Spain for introducing cocoa to the new world, I mean, from the new world to Europe and <clears throat> filling it full of sugar. But to continue with Juan van der Hamen, he continues to innovate and he continues to use these flowers with these wreath-like paintings in which he creates a wreath of flowers, in this case with a landscape. And he wasn't really sure how to execute this. This painting, which is in our collection at the Meadows Museum, was conserved in 2005. It went to the conservation lab at the Kimball. And what Claire Barry and her team found was there was actually an image of a saint underneath it. So he was trying to wrestle with what he should do with this interior. I mean, it was well and good to do a floral wreath around it, but what do you do on the inside? And for this one, he chose a landscape. But for others, he decided to do a religious image, image. And so what's interesting is unlike in this one, which is just flowers, straight up flowers, in this you've got butterflies floating around and butterflies also represent resurrection. So what better way to incorporate resurrection, gorgeous flowers, which in this case has seven kinds of roses, opium poppies, Spanish broom, pomegranate blossoms, carnations, daisies, orange blossoms, etc., that all bloom at different times of the year. But you accent that, in this case, with a virgin and child in glory and a Christ appearing to St. Anthony. So once again, van der Hamen is showing his incredible skill with religious painting, with landscape painting, with floral painting. And so it's showing that he can pretty much do anything. Now, where did he find these flowers that were blooming at different times of the year. Some of them were from nature. A lot of them were from guidebooks that explorers would have. And so he could copy from those and then just arrange them as he saw fit. Now, if we continue to Pedro de Comprobin, whose work we also have in the museum, not this particular piece, that I found one place saying the National Galleries of Scotland, the National Galleries of Scotland do not show it in their collection. So not quite sure where it comes from, but. He had apprenticed in Toledo, where Sanchez Cotan had been, although much later, 1519 to 1524. And he entered the Painters Guild of Seville in 1630. And even though he's not an artist we talk about much these days, he was one of the founders of the Academy of Painting in Seville, along with Murillo, Herrera the Younger, Valdez Leal, and others. So he was a very important artist. And here you've got still life with dish of pears and a sprig of jasmine blossom on a ledge. So you've got, again, this, this interest in the texture of the skin and the way the light falls on it. And even with the jasmine, just these little minute elements of the petals that are so beautiful, the shadows on the plate that it that cast by the pears and the fact that the pears aren't perfect. So in all of their kind of bruised and dimpled glory. Now what we've got, what we see with his work with these florals is that they really start to loosen up. Uh, you start seeing the, um, this golden bowl, this vase, these little this ceramic dish here. And there's a much looser, much freer feeling to these florals. Again, you've got your butterfly, although I don't think this butterfly has the ulterior motive of showing resurrection the way it would in Holland. Don't know for sure, just a guess. But we have what we have in our own collection, which comes out every now and again, are, is this bouquet with lilies and roses and curtain left and right. So these would have probably flanked a doorway that went into a garden. And you've got spring and fall flowers in here. So you've got, again, sort of four seasons of florals since it is possible to do that in paint. So it's not showing dead nature, but it's showing living nature and it's, creating this ability before refrigeration and before all of the things we have today to have a year round garden. And then finally, Juan Arellano. 
And um, he does, he also specialized in flowers for the reason we are told, because it was good pay for less work. And we have also been told by Antonio Palomino, who is sort of the Spanish Vasari, the one who kind of tells us everything we needed to know about Spanish painters at the time, is that he was not a particularly good figurative painter. So he was able to turn to floral paintings. Now, neither of these are by him, but they were influences of him. The one on the left by Daniel Segers, who's a Flemish painter whose work was widely collected in Spain at the time. And the one on the right by Mario Nuzzi, who is known as Mario de Fiori, Mario of the Flowers. And his work was being co collected for the Buen Retiro, this new palace that Philip IV was having created for himself. But in the Nuzzi painting, you see this gorgeous light that comes in very much like that of Caravaggio. And then in the Seguer's painting, you've got this interior element. So um, there is this Saint, Saint Teresa on the inside. You've got you know, the wreath of flowers here and very faintly, almost in grisaille, Christ with Saint Teresa here. Now here, this is one of his paintings, Arenas, that is in the Prado in, from 1652. So we're mid-century at this point, this garland of flowers with a landscape in the background. And so it gives us almost this portal into this beautiful, serene little landscape, no people. And he's kind of following the role set forth by Juan van der Hamen. Again, these gorgeous um, tulips, you've got uh, bugs in here as well, but it again, just, just almost looks like you've got nautilus shells here that are allowing us to go forth. And then finally, the two paintings in our own collection, which are much later works. They were done in the 1670s. So far, as far as still life is a genre, they're relatively late. And you've got still life with flowers, pears, and other fruits, and still life with flowers, peaches, and red plums. I know these titles are completely non, or they're descriptive, but they're not that imaginative, but they are what they are. They are exactly a way to define which, which is which painting. But what he does is he's putting these into wicker baskets. So again, a freer, looser way of depicting flowers. And this becomes his signature and he's really just churning them out. The Prado has 10 of his florals alone, including three other paintings in wicker baskets. So that is a good way to recognize his work. Again, creating a different sort of stand for them, putting them up on a pedestal, literally, and surrounding them with these luscious fruits. And again, these flowers that bloom at different times of the year, clearly leading us to the premise that there was a market for this work. So just finally, even though these are on the low on the painting rung, a lot of people felt they lacked what was called invenzione, this idea of invention, creation. I argue that they have a lot of invention. I argue that they really are unique and they were constantly pushing themselves forward. The other significant thing is that they were being collected locally by locals. And why this is significant is because the Spanish monarchy preferred foreign artists. And so they were bringing in artists from abroad. They were collecting artists from abroad. But here you've got a population who is supporting their own artistic community. And it's a niche market, you know, painting for the masses, as it were, painting for the middle class is a niche market that's been completely overlooked because let's face it, we're usually focused on who's ruling the country at the time, right? So to create, to sort of give a voice to this middle class that's collecting, I think is also quite unique. So rather than calling these nature mort, I think from now on, we should call them nature vivant, living nature. And with that, I thank you. And I will turn this over to questions. Nancy, thank you. Just thank you. Thank you so much. I, uh, I don't think I'm ever going to see a still life again and not think of fried butter in the state fair. That was a great <laughs> analogy. Um, so this would be a great time for anyone who has questions to uh, go ahead and enter them in the chat box. You can also turn your screen on and physically raise your hand and I'll, I'll kind of let you know to unmute. But we do have one question already and this comes from Terry. Um, so she was interested in the strings that are so prominently visible in the Sanchez Cotan. Um, and while she acknowledges they're in, you know, other works, you can see those strings just kind of wondering, you know, do you have any thoughts on that? I think he was the first to use them for sure. 
And I think that he used them as a way to create this dimensionality. So as a way to sort of create, let me see if I can go back to my screen share. So by doing, putting them on a string, he's created this really strong diagonal that would not be, we wouldn't be able to have otherwise. And so I think it was really a compositional element. It was a way to create dimensionality. And, um, you know, so you've got all these strong diagonals going this way and then going back into space. And, and then our cucumber, our pickle here goes this way. So again, just this crisscrossing of diagonals that makes it a far more interesting and dynamic composition. Thank you. Sure. All right. I will just hang tight for more people to, uh, to add in questions. And the cake, Jean, I'd love to have you over for the cake, but I made that a while ago. It's gone. It's long. <laughs> it's not one that lasts <laughs> long. So I'll have to make it again, or you'll have to make it and enjoy it. It's really quite delicious. OK, so Maria is wondering about um, where these still lives would have originally hung inside someone's home. That's a great question. Some of them would have hung in a garden room. So if the home had a garden room, others, certainly the still lives with food would have hung in a dining area. So again, yeah, certainly a prominent place. You know, if you're going to buy art, you want it someplace people would see it. So it would have been in a public space, in a public room. Thanks, Nancy. Sure. Any other questions? We'll give people time to type. But again, I just, you know, thank you all for coming today because, you know, I know still life, you usually say still life to people and their eyes are all back and they, it's like, oh God, what a yawner. But they really are interesting once you do a deep dive. So I'm, I'm hoping I've converted some of you kind of maybe not still life people into more still life people <laughs> through all this. Okay, so oh. Harry is still thinking about the Sanchez Cotan. Um, how difficult is it for a museum to acquire one at this point? You know, I don't know what the market is, you know, again, because he stopped painting them relatively early. But I agree with you, Terry. We need one at the Meadows Museum. He's sort of the, the big three, the missing one of the big three Spanish still alive painters whose work we don't have. They are expensive. I mean, that Feda Galicia, who's an artist, really relatively unknown, sold in 2019 for $2.4 million, US dollars. So that's kind of a relatively unknown artist. A Sanchez Cotan, I can only imagine. But I would be happy to help spearhead, maybe not fund, but spearhead <laughs> a drive to create a fund for a Sanchez Cotan if one comes available. Okay, going back to kind of your introduction to your talk today, you, you spoke about the different hierarchy that painting had, right? The, the genre, the right where this all fell and how still life was really kind of the lowest rung. Could you just kind of cover that again? Um, mm -hmm. So if so, it was the lowest, the lowest of, of the, the paintings, you know, what made people motivated to buy them? Well, here's what I'll tell you, you know, history is written by the victors, right? So who was it who said that history painting was the top of the heap? It was the people who were commissioning history painters. The reason why they were, and still life was like, well, anyone can own a still life. So that was the idea that, you know, you almost had to be royalty to commission a painting of um, the Battle of Lepanto, say, you know, this decisive victory in 1575. But anyone could own a still life because they were being sold. You, you know, some of these people were just selling them on street corners base or to that, or just through private people. So. I think they were considered the bottom of the rung because they were so approachable and because they were so accessible because middle-class people could own them. And therefore, you know, it puts them at the bottom. Just like if, you know, if, if you can only own, let's just whatever, a Vuitton bag, and then suddenly everyone on the street can own a Vuitton bag, that takes away some of the allure. So, but for the people on the street, they're happy to have maybe the, the knockoff or something like it you know, so if that makes any sense, maybe that's not a good analogy, but it, it, it was an accessible art form. And I think when something is accessible for the people who can afford the inaccessible stuff, suddenly um, anybody can have that. So I hope that's, 
clearer. Yes, thank you. And I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. And Terry, I'm just acknowledging that you're starting to save some pennies in a piggy bank and we'll we'll see how much that grows. So put my pennies with your pennies, Terry, and we'll keep our fingers <laughs> crossed. Well, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon and a tremendously huge thank you to Nancy Cohen Israel for this fantastic presentation. So thank you, um, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you all. We hope to see you at future uh, virtual programs here at the Meadows Museum. Yes, and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Stay safe.